demonically possessed, and both having a serious attitude problem. The stars of their 1977 and 1983 films featuring these two icons of horror both seem to be the subject of debate as to which one is the true king or queen of horror movie cars and why they deserve the number one spot. In 1977, audience got to see for the first time the film about a demonically possessed car simply titled The Car. It was released in a year where box office records were being broken, as the somewhat bleak era of the 70s disaster movies were coming to an end, and the rise of the upbeat, fun at all costs cinema outing was returning to screens. Seen for good reason is what can be described as Jaws on Land, given its subject matter of a small local town sheriff dealing with the monster lurking about as it suddenly arrives and begins to randomly appear and attack local residents and passerbys, stalking and killing them one by one. Written by Michael Butler, Dennis Ryak, and Lane Slate, the car was not the first idea seen on screen about a possessed vehicle going on a rampage, but it had been up to date until then, one of the more ambitious and successful shown. With the connection of Steven Spielberg already present, the car borrowed inspiration from another Man vs. Machine film, from the 1971 made-for-TV, Duel, which saw another everyday man faced with an extraordinary menace that had placed him in its sights. Unlike the previously mentioned film, where there were hints suggesting that the vehicle itself was the monster, and if there was a driver of said rig used, they too may have been a demonic manifestation. Yet here in the Elliot Silverstein directed film, the presence of the car is confirmed to not be of this earth. Based on a 1971 Lincoln Continental Mark III, the car is shown to simply arrive in a desert town at random and with no backstory given as to where it came from or why it has chosen this form and location. As we are introduced to it by seeing it drive about and attack two bike riders without any provocation and drive away soon after. Lurking about from site to site, the car continues to attack anyone it comes across and our protagonist of Sheriff Wade Parent is soon alerted that his town is being stalked as panic begins to take over with tales of a black car seen to not have any driver and a fear that something evil and spiritual has arrived as soon after, one by one, the sheriff sees his men killed trying to stop this machine. The mystery of the car itself is never fully explained as to why it suddenly appeared in this small Utah country town or what spiritual entity was behind its actions. It is established early on that the car is pure evil and its existence is only that of seeking to torment and kill anyone that crosses its path or dares challenge it. Though limited by its earthly design in terms of being grounded on four wheels, this did not stop the car from performing a number of incredible stunts, most of which were done practically on set. Shown to share some classical monster tropes, in terms of fear of holy ground and other religious forces, the car seemed to be indestructible, as it at first seems that nothing could get between it and its target victims. Come the climax of the film, in a last ditch effort, the setting up of explosives was performed by the sheriff and his crew to take out the car once and for all. And after a series of chases, the final confrontation reveals the Continental's true form, suggesting being perhaps the ultimate eagle itself, sitting behind the wheel of this classic American muscle car. Originally published the same year of its movie release, the book Christine, written by famed horror novelist Stephen King, was to be a follow-up on the success the then-new writer at the time was having, thanks to the hit of his first book turned horror movie, Carrie. This time though, he followed up with the story of a possessed 1958 Plymouth Fury corrupting a young, impressionable high school nerd by the name of Arnie Cunningham who uses his car to get back at bullies who tormented him and destroyed his prized V8 possession. The film incarnation of King's novel very slightly as some aspects needed to be changed to fit the screen format like the previous King book, this time directed by John Carpenter, still hot off his 1978 horror breakout hit film, Halloween. This combination of King and Carpenter was to produce what many have argued as to be the best inclusion of the horror subgenre of the possessed cars from Hell films. With Christine the movie starting off showing the birth of the red 1958 Plymouth Fury two-door sedan, which mistakenly in the book was written as a non-existent four-door Fury, we see from the get-go she was a standout and a one-of-a-kind model as the 1958 Fury was only ever available in a beige color base, as was seen from the other cars of the factory line. With one factory inspector suffering some physical damage from getting too personal with her, Christine soon after performs her first kill in an off-screen moment, already showing us, the audience, that she was indeed born with the mean streak. The story cuts to present day of 1978, where we meet high school jock Dennis in a blue 1968 Dodge Charger and childhood friend and social misfit Arnie Cunningham on their way for their first day of senior year of high school. After suffering an attack in auto shop class by a gang of bullies, a theme common for a Stephen King story, the two friends come across a now older, beat-up version of Christine that is for sale and placed in the backyard of an old rundown home. Soon after, with Arnie obtaining Christine and the repairs completed, Arnie goes through a change in confidence and style to mimic the era of the Fury, and the current Arnie become the target of his old bullies once more. 
After almost seeing his then new girlfriend Lee choke to death in Christine at a drive-in, Arnie returns the car back to the garage he is now being stored, where she is brutally attacked by the bullies, leaving nothing but a pile of mess and destruction behind. Upon refusing his parents' offer to replace his car, Arnie decides to rebuild Christine, and it is here we the audience get to see the full extent of her powers and her mission to seek revenge on those who would harm her or Arnie. With differences within the movie and the book being evident, as originally it was Roland LeBay who sold Christina Arnie and not his brother, and the back brace seen on George LeBay in the movie was a reference to the one worn by Roland as part of what needed Christine to rebuild herself was the requirement to be pushed around to gather enough strength to slowly build herself back up, something that Arnie had to do in the book as well, and the idea of the spirit of Roland LeBay influencing Arnie once he died soon after selling Christine to the young high schooler was also left out of the film to avoid any similarities to another movie that came out a few years before in An American Werewolf in London. Opting for a black 1971 Lincoln Continental Mark III as the car of choice to play this demon on four wheels, steps were taken to make this luxury Ford even more impressive on the road, as there were no intentions to hide it in the shadows or suggest its presence alone without showing it off. Customized by Hollywood car legend George Barris of 1960's Batmobile and Monstermobile fame, three Lincolns were obtained and modified for use in the film, first beginning with lowering of the roof, then the altering of the front end, which due to the limitations of the time, was not done in fiberglass or plastic, yet metal furbishing in order to give it its menacing scale. Painted in a matte black finish, the cars carried the stock standard Ford 460 V8 engine with 365 horsepower, which was at the time one of the last high performance big block engines still available as the oil crisis of the early 1970s was about to take place, which was to change motoring history forever from there on. Originally developed as a competitor for the Cadillac Eldorado, the Continental Mark III continued to be the flagship for the Ford Motor Company and their spot in the luxury car division. Produced from 1969 to 1971, the Mark III was first unveiled in March of 1968 by Ford at the running of the 12 Hours of Sebring. The Continental Mark III was marketed within the Lincoln Mercury division, yet the Mark III was a separate model from the standard Lincoln Continental sedan line. Selling just under 80,000 units in its short production run, the model did see its biggest sales number in its final year of 1971 and was almost equal to the El Dorado sales number that same year. For its usage in the 1977 film, during production which took place in Utah, one of the biggest problems of filming the car itself was in the constant issue with dust given the desert setting of the film, as the Lincoln would very easily get covered in it, and often at times, given its black paint scheme, would need constant cleaning. Due to its two pieces combined tinted window glass setting of either a goldish yellow tint and a more darker tone, dust would often get in between the sheets of plexiglass used and block the view of the stunt driver, which led to a concern of hitting of the car stunt location while filming. In order to play on the idea of the car being demonically possessed, the sound department would lift cues from other classic monster movie sound folly to play out on this theme. It was also given a distinctive car horn to give away its presence, the sound of which was actually playing out in Morse code the letter X to further tease the danger behind this custom Lincoln. With the final shot requiring to see the car go off a cliff while trying to run down the film's lead, director Elliot Silverstein wanted to see the Lincoln land on all four tires. In order to accomplish this feat, it was required to propel the car from a large accumulator that would shoot the Lincoln off a pipe welded underneath it. Initially a mistake took place, on its first attempt, the crew who worked on setting up the pipe had not welded it correctly and the pipe itself crashed right through the vehicle and luckily passed the camera crew stationed at the bottom of the cliff by several hundred feet. Although initially three complete Lincolns were made for the 1977 film for driving and stunt work, a fourth was also produced for close-up and static shots. The car is never shown in a broken down state nor seen to repair itself on screen when damage was to take place. By the end of production of the film, all but one of the custom Lincolns were destroyed and the last surviving car is now said to be in private hands some have suggested somewhere in Europe. For the production itself, being backed by Columbia Pictures with a generous budget for a horror film at the time of just under $10 million, the production team was said to have been able to obtain 24 to 27 Plymouths for customizing and use for Christine, where 17 were said to have been completed and built. The uses in engines varied from scenes required, as there was no other way to do the film other than practical effects showing the car destroyed, as no CGI was capable at the time to complete the request needed to see the Plymouth Fury be demolished and rebuild itself on screen. Being a sub-series of the Plymouth Belvedere that was first produced in 1955, the Fury was sold from 1956 till 1989, only coming out as a two-door, and in 1958 was only available in a buckskin beige color scheme with gold anodized aluminum trim. 
With multiple Plymouths obtained and varying, so too was the engine options within them, such as a 5.2 litre V8, yet one of the engines that were actually shown on screen was that of a 5.7 litre 350 cubic inch Golden Commando with 305 horsepower and two four barrel carburetors. As mentioned before, Christine in the book was indeed written as a Plymouth Fury. One of the main reasons being chosen by writer Stephen King as such was he wanted to avoid any overly recognisable or celebrated car models, and the name Fury had gained his attention for his story of a possessed car being a fitting match. Mistakenly written as a four-door, and having an automatic with a gear shift lever, Christine was also written as having an autumn red paint scheme, a plot point mentioned in the film itself, in a deleted scene where it was found on the bones of one of Christine's victims, where in reality, the colour option was not available on the Fury, yet the closest available by Plymouth in their other models that matched was either Toreador Red or possibly Flame Red. The Chrysler family based 1958 Plymouth Fury was already a difficult car to locate for production, as it was one of the lesser appreciated of the time 1950s long body V8s that came out that decade, and lesser known or celebrated as the Chevy Bel Air or the Corvette. In 1958, only 5,300 Furies were said to have been produced by Plymouth which led to the production using Belvedere and Savoy's from 1957 and 58 to help meet the production needs. In order to achieve the now infamous scene where we and Arnie see for the first time Christine to repair herself, special effects supervisor Roy Orbegast suggested a John Carpenter hydraulics be used, welded and placed inside the car to reverse the footage where needed to achieve this in-camera effect. The most iconic image of Christine, outside of a factory perfect form, was in seeing her emerge from the flames of a gas station explosion. In order to achieve this, the Fury was rigged to be able to maintain a long enough burn without destroying the car or injuring its driver. Stunt coordinator and legend Terry Leonard took up the task of being the driver for this dangerous stunt. Wearing a special fire suit and oxygen tank in order to complete this stunt, Terry also had to deal with the difficulty of not only driving in a car immersed in fire, but also being unable to see due to the windows of Christine being smoked completely black to keep the mystery of if there was indeed someone behind her wheel or not. Given the amount of damage the Plymouth took in the film, and how only 24 were found for use, by the end of production, it is said only two complete Christine Furies were left, with the third said to have been later rebuilt from the remaining parts that were sent off for scrap. Arriving just two weeks before one of the biggest impacts on pop culture and cinema history, the car was released on May 13, 1977 and garnered in just under 13 million US dollars at the box office, which although was not a failure by any means, it of course fell well short of expectations, as Universal was hoping the similarities to Jaws and a summer release was to have brought in similar earnings. Panned from the go by critics and other moviegoers alike, the car received its fair share of harsh ratings and became an almost embarrassment to those who took part in it. Unlike most, if not all possessed horror car movies that came before and since, the car is one of the few, if only exceptions, of a horror car character to get a sequel or even a remake. Though unofficially labelled as such, the 2019 film The Car Road to Revenge bears little to no connection to the original film, with only some minor homage moments and one returning actor playing a different role. This time the car of choice is a black Chrysler 300C and much like its original inspiration, the 2019 film did not get a praise reception upon its release. Regulated to that of being part of the lesser known and remembered films release of the 1970s, that would usually appear on late night television from there on, it was not surprising given its style and over the top, at times laughable acting and execution in several moments, that the car would gain cult status over the years since its release, and has gained wider respect for what it tried to accomplish. Even to this day, there are those who would suggest it deserves the number one spot on any movie list that focuses on horror vehicles, even above its Red Plymouth Fury counterpart. In the case of Christine, although again it did not make a huge impact at the box office, as it only brought in $21 million to its $9.7 million budget, yet unlike the car, Christine was able to gain more praise from critics, as it was able to touch a nerve on the American youth culture's then continuing obsession with cars, and the joy of falling in love with them. Christine was a movie in a car that never seemed to go away, as it continued to have a known place within the horror genre, and continued to grow in popularity, as more and more generations got to see this movie, and its practical effects that still hold up even to this day. Not to mention the stellar performance of the young cast involved, and John Carpenter's directing and synth score, and rock soundtrack selection. One of its greatest advantages over its rival, is that where the custom Lincoln was made to look fierce and intimidating, the Plymouth Fury was almost as released from the factory, minus its non-stock available red paint scheme and smoked windows when required. Its design and presence, even for the time, was one that represented a different era in Americana motoring history, and she is indeed a work of automotive beauty. Given the 1958 Plymouth Fury's age now, going on 60 plus years since it rolled out from the factory, it has made the car a much more difficult addition for any movie car aficionado to track down and obtain. Yet given its stock presentation, it is indeed a car that would be a welcomed addition to any collector's garage. Unlike its dated counterpart, Christine remains a much loved film and one of director John Carpenter and writer Stephen King's most loved projects as it continued to make appearances in other films and references to both artists' careers. 
At the end of the day, both Christine and the car have a special place for a lot of people, and the battle for the top spot may never be fully determined, as most fans remember when and where they saw their preferred movie of choice for the first time, and why it will always be their number one pick. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like, subscribe and bell icon, and feel free to check out our merchandise and follow us on Instagram via the links in the description below to help this channel grow in order to bring you more content such as this one, as your support is what keeps this channel going.